Hi, I'm Mitch Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at ANSYS with Norman Chang, Chief Technologist, who's going to talk today about uh, the application of machine learning. Norman, there's been a lot of buzz about artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, but what has been missing from a lot of that is how is this stuff really going to be used? Yes, I have been working on this problem since uh, 30 years ago at Berkeley. I work on a PhD project for applying machine learning on, uh, at that time we call AI, um, for semiconductor equipment and process monitoring and diagnosis. So at that time we were using uh, expert systems, uh, Bayesian reasoning, case-based reasoning to build out the case. However, at that time, the data is really not there. So we have to build an interface uh, for the equipment to get the data out from the plasma etching machine and we really have to build the database uh, to document all the problems so we can build a case-based reasoning. So right now, today is uh, really a little bit different because uh, more and more data becomes uh, available. And with the maturity of machine learning and deep learning techniques, that is uh, a better chance at this time that we can look at this problem again and apply machine learning to improve manufacturing efficiency to improve the e even the EDA tools, uh, which is a new area that all the EDA companies are looking into at this moment. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So this is from ANSYS' uh, point of view. Uh, where can we apply the machine learning and deep learning? That we have a group of people inside ANSYS. Uh, we are looking at all the possible applications in mechanical area, fluent area, also for semiconductor on chip packaging system area. And if you look at today's uh, hot design topic, such as uh, 3D printing, and so we can apply generative design using uh, generative of a serial network technique, which is a very popular deep learning technique to generate a whole bunch of design options and then applying design critique to see which design is uh, best suitable for the design input. So that would be part of the simulation input construction. So is this for adding efficiency into the designs? Is it for improving the uh, reliability? Is it for cutting costs? This is uh, improving the efficiency and also innovation of the design. Because from the uh, computer of machines uh, point of view, that automatic generative design sometimes can surprise human beings. Now, we haven't seen a design uh, from this angle, but it satisfies all the objectives like roughness, the robustness and also uh, the working level or the frequency level. So it's uh, really a new area that machine can help us uh, in assistance of the design. So what are the other areas that machine learning can be applied? Yeah, so let's look at one very popular area is the input data reduction. Uh, for example, if you are performing the Monte Carlo simulations, uh, you have to run uh, traditional Monte Carlo simulation. However, at this point, and for example, for variance generation uh, using the money color, that will take too long. So there will be a, we, for example, an answer that we have a technique to reduce the simulation time to generate a variance uh, uh, and compare to the traditional money color simulation technique is the same accuracy, but we can reduce by hundreds to thousand times faster and less simulation required. So the other area is that uh, how do we identify the representative input because simulation bandwidth is limited. So for example, that given the chip simulation and for, from every block, there will be a tremendous combination of vectors uh, coming from different blocks. So how do we identify a representative vector uh, combining uh, from different blocks for the full chip simulation? That's one of the problems we are working on. How long does this normally take? I mean, are we talking hours, weeks, months? Yeah, for fluent simulation, it may take a week or month. Uh, for semiconductor chip simulation, we are talking about uh, overnight or a couple of days uh, simulation. And so to find a representative input is really important, not only for uh, semiconductor application, but also very important for mechanical and fluent simulation yeah, application. And let's move on to simulation. So once we have the input, and the simulation time can be too long. And because uh, maybe some of the input is irrelevant, that we do not need to uh, 
do the simulation in such a detailed uh, time step, for example. And for uh, meshing or for thermal simulation, there's always a meshing required. So adaptive meshing, which is a very heuristic method, and if you have enough previous historical data, you can really use a machine learning technique to determine where is the meshing needed, uh, such as if you want to do a meshing on uh, automotive, automotive, and which is a big problem that uh, where you would have to determine the detailed meshing needed. A runtime predictor, uh, which is a good problem for simulation tools, that even the input for the simulation tool, you want to determine how much time does it take uh, to finish the simulation. So given the input data size and the configuration, that we can train the system using the machine learning technique to predict the wrong time. And the last another list for simulation is to build a surrogate model or the hybrid model. Surrogate model is like given the simulation that we can build a behavior model and that can run very fast. You don't need to spend the same one day, two day, or one week time that you get the surrogate model. And you can apply the surrogate model in the digital twin, which is a simulation along with the equipment running at the same time. And that's uh, as for simulation. Can you reuse some of these things? Can you prune down some of these models so that they are faster, more efficient, run faster? Yeah, definitely. That uh, once you have a lot of experience uh, in building this, uh, the, the behavior model, uh, you can apply it to many places. And this all based on the historical data, the training data you have, or so-called the preparation. And so this really plays uh, in a lot of roles, uh, using the uh, surrogate model or behavior model in the channel analysis or in, or in the measurement space using the deep uh, neural network or channel uh, surrogate model build up. So what happens after the simulation? What comes next? So after the simulation, uh, uh, we've done a lot of data. And if you look at individual customers, uh, they run the simulation using different tools. And with the different simulation data, uh, for example, for semiconductor manufacturing, uh, they can use the data for monitoring, diagnosis, for anomaly detection, or you can also guide the uh, simulation. What's the next simulation needed for optimization? Like, for example, you can use a Bayesian optimization technique to tell you what's the needed simulation as the next step to cover the shortage uh, from the simulation data you've got so far. And the second reason is that we want to open the domains, uh, do the correlation across different domains, like the dynamic voltage drop, uh, do the correlation with the timing data, and timing data certainly is using different companies' tool that we, uh, we can enable customers to correlate between the dynamic voltage drop and timing data use coming from different tools and for optimal design decisions. That's another project we are working on. So uh, finally, that, so we bring back to the optimization loop, uh, doing the, what's the next simulation needed. But the most important uh, from our experience working with uh, Nvidia and a couple of customers uh, for the last year or two is that you really need to work with your customers and ask them uh, what kind of heuristics they are performing now in their design flow and uh, what kind of wish list they have. Then you can possibly come out with the machine learning techniques to apply in those heuristic, heuristics and to solve the particular problems they have. Most engineers, when they look at this, tend to think in terms of very fixed numbers. What you're talking about here is a very tight distribution of behavior. What's the mindset that has to come across, and, and how do you work with this, uh, these ideas to say, this is the correct way, this is the close enough, or this is the, the optimum way that you're going to do this? Because really what you're talking about here is optimization. Yes. And that's a very good question because traditionally we are uh, designing algorithms or analytical techniques like uh, in the IR drop or the present route, it's all uh, algorithms and nothing uh, is quite deterministic. But here, when we apply the machine learning or deep learning techniques, that we are using uh, some of the heuristics that in the machine learning deep learning techniques. And if you come out with results you don't like, it doesn't make sense. 
it's not easy to debug a deep learning model, for example. And this is not a particular problem for semiconductor or for EDA industry. It's a common problem for all the industries now when they apply a deep learning uh, technique and to build a model like autonomous driving. And when there's a problem, and it's not easy to debug the model. However, for our EDA space, uh, we are lucky that most of the time we are not running mission critical applications. So when we encounter a problem that the deep learning model doesn't generate the result we wanted, that we can look at the data, we can generate more data, and most of the time maybe the data has an issue, so we need to clean up the data. And then we can look at the model parameters, the hyperparameters models, and see if we can get a clue that will cause the problem. So where do engineers go wrong? What surprises them? Yeah, so when we deploy a machine learning system at customer site, and if the result is not ex expected, uh, they cannot simply send a test case, and then we run through the uh, analysis. It's true, they have to send the whole historical data along with it. And most likely, we have to debug on site. And then, as I said, we need to look at the data site, uh, if it's clean or if there's a problem, uh, corruption in the data, and is there anything wrong with the model that we are building. And so you have to look at it from multiple perspectives and to debug the problem. Where have you been working with us? What's your experience? So uh, for the last year and two, uh, we have been working on a machine learning system uh, for EN uh, waiver system for electro migration sign up with uh, NVIDIA. And we published a tech, uh, paper together at ASP DAC uh, earlier this year. And for that paper, the objective of the system is that, that when people are running through Totem, Totem is our transistor sign off tool for IREM. And after they run through a new design, for example, IP, and they get uh, hundreds of thousands of EM violations. And they have uh, uh, quite a few people, quite a few designers design different IPs. The senior designer have to work with the junior designers to look at every EM violation and determine that if this EM violation can be waived or can be fixed. So how do they do that? They look at the previous uh, historical experience that has this problem been looked at before and uh, what's the reason that this problem can be waived even though it has an EM violation. So EM violation is a set, uh, it's a fixed threshold given from Foundry and our tool just follow the simulation and uh, calculating the current density and come out with EM violation. But there are many different reasons that it can be a less common case or can be the block, the activity module is less frequently used and so you cannot uh, use the very rigorous EM limit to gauge the EM violation. Or it can be a tool bug, of course that never happened in our tools. No. How's the learning curve for, you're talking about a senior uh, developer versus a junior developer, how's the learning curve? Because there, ha there are not that many experts out there these days in AI. That's right. Yeah, it's not particularly AI. They, this is from their historical experience. They look at a problem. The senior designer have to determine if this problem needs to be fixed or not. Yeah, even though it's a, it's an EM violation from Foundry's point of view, and there are many complicated situations they need to look at. And if if you don't have a resource, uh, because in the FinFET design, in sixty nanometer down to seven nanometer design, the, there are more and more EM violations uh, occurring. And so you have really have to priori pri uh, prioritize that which EM problems you want to fix first. So this system that we are using the machine learning techniques, uh, using the dynamic uh, k-means uh, clustering and then use uh, k-nearest neighbor to look for the nearest uh, similarity of the EM violations and then give a risk scoring that can this new EM violation be waived or should be fixed. And so let's describe uh, in detail in the paper that you can look it up as from the ASP deck. Assuming this goes as planned, what does chip design look like at five nanometers and three man nanometers? Does it change because of this technology? Uh, yes, uh, when this uh, technology is, uh, is deployed in place at customer site, and it's just like a senior designer always working with you and looking at your IP blocks EM violation. It will give you a suggestion or he or she uh, as a senior designer knowledge 
embedded, embodied in the EM waiver system will tell you that if this EM violation can be waived according to the historical database or should be fixed and it has a very high risk. So it provides a uniform consensus uh, from the knowledge of the senior designers that uh, to help the junior designers to look at this problem carefully. And, and we know that uh, it only takes one year validation to kill the chip. Norman Chang, thanks for some great insights into a very interesting area of development. Thank you.